I smell cooks looking for sales. Shook crooks turning the tails. We keep the good looks for the straight rook nights burning from L's. Uh, birth in this hell, I should have been dead or jail. I've been destined to fail. Don't give a fuck my record sales. It's your boy Bobby Krills, and right now you're tuned into the Harder City Podcast. And today I have an exclusive interview, very special interview with somebody who's been uh, a part of the growth of the city of Perth Amway, somebody who's very influential at the moment and has seen the development of our city and has, you know, plays a major role in where we're going in the future. Um, I'm super excited about this interview. This is something that I never thought would actually come into fruition, but it actually did, and it landed in my lap. And I'm happy to invite to the show today uh, JB Voss. JV Voss, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's great to have you on the show. Um, My first podcast. Is this really? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, not the first one I've listened to, but like, you know, are you, being, on, being on a podcast. Are you a podcast listener? My, my wife's more of a podcast person than I am. Okay. Yeah. Any Anything in particular that you guys listen to? No, she's more the podcast person, more the boring stuff, uh, you know, the NPR kind of uh, Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, into books and stuff like that, I'm assuming. Audio, you're, you're audio, audio, audio books. I do a lot of magazines. I like, I like The Atlantic quite a bit. And I okay. read The Times. Okay, that's how, I mean, those are stuff those that you kind of have to read. <laughs> those are two I, I, I like to glance at every day, and then, you know, get my some of my media just from the Star-Ledger, Home News Tribune, but a lot of that stuff today is mostly Associated Press. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we count, we copy count, and paste. but we count on people with podcasts and, you know, to some extent, you know, Facebook media of some variety to get some of our news. I mean, yeah. we have to verify it. But, you know, you are a good source for people because, you know, you, you have your own credibility. Yeah. And that lends itself to being a credible source, you know, assuming that you're consistent with it. Yeah. And that's the goal. We're trying to be consistent. And honestly, I just want to thank you again for coming on the show because, you know, you kind of give us that 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 validity. So, a pleasure. you know, I appreciate my pleasure. it. My pleasure. So I want to dive into uh, J.B. Voss and, and talk about a little bit, little bit about who you are as a person and how we've gotten to this point in your life. And, you know, it's a very exciting time for you because we got elections coming up and... Yeah. And you're campaigning, and yeah, it's, it's exciting it, stuff. It's it's exciting because I, you know I don't know if, what you know about me, but I did run back in 2020. But 2020 was a sort of a crazy election because it was, was a the, crazy year. Yeah, it was in the <laughs> middle of the pandemic. Nobody knew it. Announced in in, in January ish, and that's when they were still talking about whether or not they were going to shut down. Yeah. And then everything shut down. You couldn't knock on doors until maybe August. You couldn't hold a rally or a fundraiser. Yeah. So it made for a different kind of election. And then what was different also was that none of the polls were open. Everything was vote by mail. Yeah. So it was the first experience with it, uh, an entirely vote by mail election. Yeah. So um, I'm enjoying this a lot more because I've been out there talking to people. Yeah. Um, this election's different than even the 2020 election because they changed the form of our election to a partisan election in Perth Amboy. So yeah. now um, the election that we're focused on right now is the primary, which is on June 4th. Yeah. And there'll be three candidates. Well, two others, including myself, that I will be vying for the Democratic uh, nomination for to, to run as run for mayor and city council in the November election. Now, when you say the Democratic nomination, does that mean you're going to be getting backed by the county guys, or is it no is it I, deeper than that? Well, so there's a lot of stuff that's coming out. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the decision that came out with Andy Kim. So right now there is an open Senate seat because okay. Bob Menendez is not seeking re-election for. Personal reasons, I'll leave, I'll leave <laughs> yeah. it at that. I don't want to delve too deep into that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in in that seat becoming vacant and becoming available, uh, there are a number of Democrats, registered Democrats, that were vying for that position. They included Tammy Murphy, which yeah. is the wife of the current governor. Okay. Uh, Andy Kim, who I believe is a current congressperson who is not seeking re-election. Now he's seeking the Senate seat. And there is uh, Patricia Campos, who is a labor leader. Um, she's been around the state for quite a while that's vying for the Senate seat as well. Now, Andy, so the, the way it was stacking up, and I don't want to bore anybody to death, but I'll give you a little bit of yeah. the background, is that New Jersey is one of, was one of the few states in the country that allowed essentially the local county organization to decide who was going to be their Democratic nominee. Yeah. And they would sit on the entire line, if you will. So like 
right this year Joe Biden's running for re-election, right? So yeah. he would be the top of the ticket. Second on the line would have been the Senate senatorial person. So whoever the local county organization was going to support would get the position right underneath Joe Biden. And what they found was that, you know, that would have a disparate impact on some of the other Democrats who were, or I don't want to say disparate, it would give an advantage to whoever sat on the street. Now, this is the county line issue that we were talking yes, about. Yes, exactly. So, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, essentially, there was, a, there was a federal decision that said that it would advantage certain Democrats and it wasn't, it should not be used. Anymore. It increases the chances of them winning the winning, election correct. by a tr uh, dramatic amount. It was uh, correct. 19 to 30 something percent, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Correct. And yes, th and th this, this all plays into the local election. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but like last November, Perth Amboy had no other local elections here in town and they put a referendum on the ballot to change our form of election to a partisan style election. And, in my opinion, that was done to advantage the incumbent because the incumbent, Helman Kaba, who's the mayor, also sits as the chairperson of the Demo local Democratic organization, which is Perth Amboy. Um, and so he wanted to change that form of election because he would get the line and he assumed that he was going to get a 30% advantage by just having the line. And in, in large part, even the process of getting the nomination from the local organization was skewed because they didn't have an open and fair process because Hellman is also the chairman. So he got, he decided to, do, to create a screening committee as opposed to allow all the candidates who were interested in vying for the Democratic nomination go before the entire committee in a truly Democratic process, right? Yeah. Where you would ask anybody that's a committee person for their support. Instead, they wanted to create a limited um, screening committee, which was anointed by the current chairperson, which was... So everything Helman. was working in, yeah, in exactly, favor. Yeah, exactly. So they never ended up giving an endorsement to anybody uh, because of the decision that Kim brought before the, the uh, federal court, okay. which, is, which found that it would advantage anybody who got the county organization support and got the line. So now the new ballot uh, is going to have little boxes where it would be all the senatorial candidates it wouldn't be a, a line format it's more of like a block format and you actually get to look at it and, and right. make your so, decisions so it doesn't look like there like a, a ranking almost a ranking or an anointment if you will yeah and so but like i would argue that the changes that they made in november have drastically changed elections here in perth amboy going forward no matter what happens now this, this got approved yes so and here's the interesting part and i i, I want to harp on a couple of words there was no other local elections in Perth Amboy in 2023. And that's when this happened. And the only decision or the only question before the people of Perth Amboy was whether or not they should change their form of election. There was only, I believe, like 2,600 people that came out to vote. Yeah. Perth Amboy has like some 16,000 or so Democratic, Registr Democratic registered voters. And probably more than that when you look at undeclared and Republican Republican. Um, people who are registered as, as Republicans. So they really are limiting the number of people who get to vote and who have a voice in our elections. And it kind of controls it. It does. It's, it controls it. Does it. Because, yeah, I can see Because it's like the preliminaries. If you don't, if you don't make the batch, then... I, I, I get it, yeah. You're, 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 you're setting the playing field and the stage for how... You know, you're definitely like just... It's manipulation. Yeah. It, it is. It is yeah. a manipulation. So... The positive thing is that they went to a block format because of that federal decision. The local organization, the screening committee for the local organization, yeah. decided not to support any candidate at this point. And we're out there all trying to vie for uh, the Democratic uh, support. Okay. And so that's what will be decided on June 4th. And it's such an important election, not because I want to get ahead of myself, but like in a town like Perth Amboy that's 90% Democratic, yeah. the the decision as to who their next mayor and city council members are going to be is going to be decided in June. Yeah. And the chances are that the election in November is not nearly as close as the election in June. Okay. So that's why it's so So this important. is a crucial point. No, it's absolutely crucial because absolutely. the chances are that whoever wins the Democratic election in uh, June is going to be the next Understood. mayor of Perth Amboy. 
Okay, okay. Was that boring? That no, I no, know? honestly, no. The reason why I, I uh, brought up the county line situation was because on a previous mm-hmm. podcast episode with uh, Victor Coronado, we were discussing that. So this kind of just yeah. fed off of that. And if anybody was watching that last episode, they'll see that this is all tied in and what we're talking about is stuff that's really happening locally. Um, but before we dive into all that stuff, I want to get into you a little bit. Um, where were you born? What, uh, what city were you born in? I'm born and raised in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Okay. I was uh, conceived on Penn Street and uh, I grew up most of my life on High Street. Street. On uh, Penn Street. Penn Street. That's where. Oh, I, really? That's where. I, that's where I was conceived. Okay. Okay. That's where I was conceived. I, I am a. Um, I'm what they call an Irish twin. I'm an accident. Okay. Uh, my sister. My <laughs> sister. My sister and I are right now are the same exact age. For like a month or two, right? Two months. Yeah. Two months, which is incredible. Like true Irish twins yeah. are born in the same calendar year. Okay, so that that's impressive. Yeah, that is. And I I know one because my mother is a, is is a Irish twin as well. Okay. So um, my my mom's brother is born in January of '54. She had a brother who's now deceased, who's my godfather, yeah. uh, Irving uh, Troach. He uh, he passed away, but he was born in December of '54. Now that wow. that is yeah, that's that's that was before TV, guys. They, 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 <sighs> and then my, then my mother was born in November of '55. So they went back to back, belly to belly. Yeah. Uh, I am just my my sister was born in May of '78. I'm born in March of '79. So okay. the running joke is that. I'm older than her because my birthday falls before hers, but the reality yeah. is that she's older. Yeah. We just got to wait two months before that happens. So <laughs> we, so once my parents, uh, I guess they got pregnant with, with me, um, they moved over to High Street, and I grew up my whole life on High Street. Okay. So down by the waterfront. Perth and where, uh, Hospital, Raritan Bay? Raritan Bay, that's okay. right. That's right. And well, how many siblings do you have? That was that was when it was Perth and General Hospital. See, this is... This, this, this is before this, it was Raritan Bay, before it was Hackensack Meridian. This is an ongoing question that I had. Yeah. Uh, normally before I the expansion guess, of the hospital. Yeah, I asked I ask yeah, my guests, was, yeah. was it General Hospital or was it, it Raritan Bay? It was Perth and General Hospital at Got you, time. got you. So see, anybody that's listening, you guys see I asked this question for a reason because it's a thing. Yeah. Um, so, All right, so how many siblings do you have? I'm one of four. One of four. So I got my older sister, then me. Okay. I was, I was the celebration baby. Okay. And uh, you know, I was walking the earth for a number of years, and I, was, I must have given them a little bit of a hard time because they waited seven years so they had my younger sister. Okay. And she's born in 86. Okay. And then I have a brother who's 11 years younger than me. Okay. Uh, he's my younger brother. He's not my little brother because my brother's six six. Yeah. I end up being the shrimp out of the family. My dad's six five. You got some height on you too. No, I'm six three. I, I mean, you walk, size. You walked in the room and I'm I'm a big dude. So yeah. I looked. I was like, oh, this guy's pretty tall. No, I'm, I'm, um, I'm six. I'm six three, two twenty five on a good day. <laughs> um, my my brother's six six. He's a big boy. He's, okay. a, he's a real big boy. My dad's six five. He's, he's shrunk a little bit. He's probably about six four at this point. Yeah. He's broad shoulder and he's a big man, but yeah, they got they have to be nice to me because. I'm the point guard in the family, so if they want the ball, <laughs> can you ball? I, I used to ball. Yeah, I played at Bishop Bar for a little bit, but we'll get to that. Yeah, right? yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, we'll cool, get cool. To that. So I'm one. I'm one of four. Uh, born and raised in Perth Amboy. Uh, I, I, I went to Perth Amboy Catholic School. My mom's a staunch Catholic. Pax, right? That's what it's called. Pax. No, at that time it was just Perth Amboy Catholic schools because when I went to school, I went to Holy Spirit, which is now Good Shepherd. The okay. one that's over on Brace Avenue. It's closed by Washington Park, right? Uh, yeah, up the street from... from gotcha, the, gotcha. That's yeah. Correct, exactly. So up the street, like, you know, where Florida Grove and Brace Avenue meet, exactly. yeah, right that. there. That church is no longer active. The school is being utilized by the public school district, as I understand it. But that's where I went. And again, going back to my sister being my Irish twin, she was going into fifth grade and I was going into fourth grade. My mom didn't want to drive us to two separate schools in the morning. Uh, and there was only one option for fifth through eighth in Perth Amboy, which was St. Mary's, which okay. is now the South Campus High School. Right okay. over here, um, yeah, a mechanic, a mechanic, mechanic and uh, mechanic, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So my mom didn't like that school very much, so she didn't like the idea of taking us to two different schools in the morning. So we ended up going to St. Matthews in Edison for a period of time. Then I went to Bishop Bar in Edison, okay. and staying with the uh, Catholic mantra. Okay. And then I went to the College of New Jersey. TCNJ. Is, Trent, well, it was Trent, Trenton State. So I was the first class that didn't have an option to have either the College of New Jersey or Trenton State on the diploma. Okay. So the class before me um, had the option because I had done the, tr- the changeover. Okay. So, All right, so before we get into college, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's yeah. get – so you went to uh, the, the Perth Amway Catholic Schools, uh, St. Matthews, and that's pretty much elementary time, right? Yes. So I went to, I went to um, Holy Spirit until I was in third grade, and then I went from fourth to eighth grade 
at St. At St. Martinez behind La Peep. Okay, where did you end up going to um, behind La Peep? I like that place. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it's been the, there for a long time. Yeah, it's the breakfast spot, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Everyone yeah, knows that place. Yeah, yeah that's good stuff. Right behind there, yeah. Um, so high school, where did you end up going? You went I, went, to, I went to Bishop Bar. Bishop Bar. And okay. high school, what kind of uh, student were you? What kind of kid were you in high school? I, I would say that I was a late bloomer. I think my parents would confirm that. Uh, yeah. I was a little bit of a late bloomer. I was never... Um, I was never like a tremendous, tremendous academic student. I thought I was, I was like, you know, a B plus, you know, A minus kind of student. Yeah. Regular classes, not on, not in uh, honors classes. Um, but I worked hard. Um, but, you know, I had a lot of distractions. You know, when you're a young man, we yeah. tend to have a, little, a couple more oh, yeah, distractions. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I love playing basketball. Okay. I played basketball there for two years. Um, and then... At Bishop Bar? At Bishop Bar, yeah, I did. Okay. I remember playing Amboy at that time. Okay. And the setup for me going to Bishop Bar was, you know, and when we played Amboy, it was like a thing for me. Yeah. Because I remember the the team... Everybody like, knew you were from Amboy too, right? Well, they, they knew, yeah. They yeah. knew. They were like, Mayor Sun's coming in town. Mayor Sun's coming <laughs> to town. Yeah. So, but I, I loved it. I loved the challenge. Yeah. I played with a lot of those kids down at the waterfront when they used to have the basketball courts down at the yeah. waterfront. Yeah. When birthday Clemente, Clemente Park. Park, yeah, yeah well, they had the they had the you know the chain links over there. Yeah, always a windy park, not a shooter's park. Oh no, that's I, the water. I, I played at Washington uh, as well, and occasionally if we got a ride, we go over to Warren Park. Yeah, um, but I lo- I love playing Amboy because my memories of Amboy as a seventh and eighth grader, they had that tremendous team. I don't know if you remember. You're talking about uh, the the when they made the states and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it was Missouri. I can name the whole. I can name the whole team. That Let was me a, see that. His, yeah, yeah Rash- Rashawn Roberts. You had Ernie Gonzalez at point guard. You had uh, you had Snipes. Ronald Snipes. Whenever Snipes when he could really couldn't jump, man. I I've never saw a boy jump like that. He's gonna listen to this. He's gonna laugh. But he was jumping over tables. <laughs> at, at, you know, literally jumping over t- tables. My good buddy to this day, Julian Richardson, who. Who ended up being a lot better in, in football than in basketball. Yeah. He ended up going redshirted to University of Maryland. He played on that team, but he was already a sophomore. So I said, Rash- Rasheed Roberts, um, Snipes, you had Greco, yeah. Jose yeah. Urena. The yeah. guy could shoot the lights out. He would come out and he would like hit four or five like three pointers. There's an ongoing debate in town whether if who, who's the best three point shooter that ever came from the town. And um, you know, there's an argument. There's an argument for Jermaine Clark. Uh, Jermaine Clark is a good buddy of mine. Ooh. Jermaine Clark, good buddy of mine. He's now a firefighter. Yeah. I, I have the pleasure of being his camp counselor. Okay. Back in, uh, geez, I was probably at that point, I was in high school. He's he's like my he's like my brother's age. Yeah. Jermaine's, he's like 11 years younger. Yeah. That's about his age. And his brother, Damon, and I, we played basketball, um, um, baseball together. Okay. So I played baseball here in town. We played on uh, Bankers. For a while, I was on Raritan River. For Danboy Little League? Yeah, Raritan River Steel I played on for okay. a while. I also played Raritan on- River Steel, wow. You remember that, right? Yeah. I played, I played on both those teams. I was an orange team, and then Bankers was the, the bank on Maple and Smith. We were green. We had a pretty good team. That was, that was, a, that was, a, that was a good team. We made it to the finals. We didn't, we didn't win. Uh, we had some, you know, so there, very deep rooted into the city of Prince Amboy, the families, the people. You're very connected in here. I, I'm smiling right now because it brings up good memories of community. Absolutely. In, in this town. So, like... Perth Amboy, from the outside looking in, always seems and appears to be, like, very urban, yeah. very dense. But my experience growing up was that it was, it was there was always a close-knit community. People knew each other. There was old Amboy High, so you knew whose kids they were yeah. and who you were running with. And everybody had to be home when the lights started turning on yeah. for dinner. And so, like, I have really good memories. And, and while we're talking about this, you know, when I went to St. Matthew's in Edison... My dad was already the mayor of Perth Amboy at that time. My dad got elected when I was 11 years old. Okay. Um, so that was in like 1990. I'm born in 79. Yeah. And so I remember going to St. Matt's. And again, it's a Catholic school. Kids were coming from all over. But most of them came from Edison. You know, people that, people, people whose kids, whose parents wanted their kids to have a Catholic education. And I remember talking to some of my friends then and, or the teachers and telling them where I'm from. And I remember legitimately as a kid them having a reaction because as a kid you're very innocent but you're very astute to what yeah. people are saying or reacting to and i would tell people hey i'm from perth Amboy, and they'd be like they would grimace a little bit and i never understood that because yeah. in my mind as a kid i had this great waterfront we had so many kids to play with we play with the boyds the riggins you know danny gonzalez the, yeah, the, the, yeah. he used to play at, the, at there too he lived on lewis street at the time um, we had a lot of great kids that would just come together, kids of all walks of life. We had this beautiful waterfront, so I didn't get it. Yeah. And then 
as I got older, I got to, with the to Bishop R, I started seeing that change because there was a lot of redevelopment that was going on in Perth Amboy. We were taking back our waterfront. We were improving our waterfront. We were improving our downtown. Crime was starting to go, go down. Yeah. And I, we talked a little bit off the air, and we'll, I guess we'll get to that. I don't yeah. wanna, but uh, you grew up at Stockton Building. Yeah, absolutely. I grew we up had, on Watson. Watson. Yeah, so we had Stockton Building. Yeah. We had the Hunterton Buildings. Yeah. We had Delaney and Dunlap. Um, but there, uh, there was yeah. there was community in those buildings. Let me not take that away. Oh, absolutely. But there was, you know, you know, oh, there yeah, was yeah. there was real issues in, in Stockton. But I remember when those buildings started to come down. We started to improve the waterfront. There was people making investments in the community. I was, hey, I heard Birthday Envoy's got that nice. There was fun. a really drastic there was a vibe. change. There was a real drastic change in the '90s, and it yeah. was becoming a city that was thriving, and people were attracted to it. Yeah. So that leads me into my next, you know, my next yeah. question. I want to talk about your parents a little bit. Sure. Um, where where are they from originally? Nationality? Uh, so my mom is a hundred percent. Uh, Puerto Rican. Okay. Uh, she's Ta- she's Taino Indian. Like, okay. From Ish. from Puerto Rico, so she's got a little, little, so, little. So she's from Puerto Rico. No, no, she's born here, but her parents are. So are, genetically, she's Taino. Like for, she's for sure. her mom and yeah. dad are both Taino. Yeah. They're from Guayanilla, okay. Puerto Rico, which is on the southern side by Ponce. Okay. Um, both my grandparents are deceased at this point. My mom's one of of six children. Okay. Uh, she's the only girl out of uh, out of six kids. Okay. So imagine. <laughs> she had a lot of brothers she, that were, yeah. <laughs> she did. She was she grew up very protected. Yeah. She went to Amboy High School. Uh, That's awesome. She's born and, she's born and raised here in Perth Amboy. She graduated class of seventy four. Um, she's born in November, so she's actually the same age as my father, but she graduated a year after because of the cutoff. Yeah. yeah so she she was a year behind him. My dad, Perth Amboy. Okay. Uh, born and raised. His background: he's half Portuguese and he's half Puerto Rican. Okay. Uh, my grandmother, on my dad's side, his mom. She was from Quebradillas, Puerto Rico, okay. which is northwest. You know, it's uh, out by Aguadilla, okay. that area, San Sebastian up yeah. there. So that's where she, where she is, and she was 100%. She was born in Puerto Rico, and she migrated to, to New Jersey. His father was Portuguese, of Portuguese descent. And so he came here via the Merchant Marines. Okay. Which they were transporting, I guess, um, at that point, he was transporting, like, food and other things. Um, but he ended up staying here in New Jersey when making deliveries okay uh, you know maybe maybe it was a wall you know so, <laughs> so oh, yeah he so, went and he, he returned to the ship and he so, stayed here and he, he started a, a he saw the opportunity in perth amboy he worked at american smelting okay which is now where they're building all those warehouses out by chevron yeah um, my grandmother worked at a lamp factory and so you know they were born and raised here my dad's one of three kids okay he's got one brother who's still in town and he had a sister who just passed away this year in january she died of a uh, Ovarian cancer. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah, my only real aunt, because of my mom's yeah, they're all, all uncles over all there. Uncles on that side. So, yeah, you know, it's a wake up call for all of us. You know, yeah. you sow your mortality. So my dad went to Perth Amboy, Perth Amboy High School. Good student, very good student. Uh, he played basketball there. Okay. He, his claim to fame is that he won county championships every year while he was in Perth Amboy. What year was this? Uh, uh, do you well, remember the years he graduated? He, so well, your mom was 74, 73, right? 73, so. 72, 71, and I guess uh, 70. Okay. Those are the four years that he was there. Uh, he played with Brian Taylor's brother. Blake. Blake. Okay. And so my dad tells great stories about that. He played with uh, Louis Pennyfeather. The Pennyfeather's big family. The Pennyfeathers were a big family, a very athletic family. The One of the Pennyfeathers played for the Pirates. Yeah, I remember. Um, they were all excellent athletes. Uh, Louis just passed away just recently, I think about two years ago. So they had a good team. They, they didn't have great teams, but they willed it to counties, and they won every year. We're always tough. Amboy's always tough. Uh, sometimes we're outsized, but we will run you off the court. Um, That's their game. Transition ball. We're going to steal it. You're gonna, we're going to press you, and fast breaks all day. Yep. <laughs> if you're asking us to set up, it might be a problem, but... <laughs> yeah, no, no, totally, totally. Run and gun. Yeah. Run and gun. But uh, shout out to Missouri, by the way. One of the best coaches ever. For yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he, was on, he was on the team we were just talking about. With, yeah, uh, yeah. That's with, Gre- the, with Greco yeah, and yeah, Snipes and for all sure. those. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they're doing some memorial for him um, okay. coming up, but um, that's neither here nor there. So um, your parents... Puerto Rican and you got some Portuguese that's uh, right. culture, and so and that's always room, there's always room for other, you know. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done my genetic breakdown because you know I don't want the federal government knowing too I, much about me. I did it for my mother, and I was surprised with what I saw. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't even. Who knows what I am? Um, so my sister did it. My, yeah. My younger sister did it, and so like you know, genetically you're pretty close, depending yeah. on how much you take from your mom and your dad. So yeah. Mostly Iberian Peninsula. Okay. So which is you know Spain, Portugal, that area right there. Yeah. That's the other two. All right, cool. So your dad is um Puerto Rican, Portuguese. Your mom Puerto Rican. Um, 
the hot topic obviously would be your father was mayor for Perth Amboy for a long time, Joe Voss. Yeah. Um, great times in Perth Amboy when he was when he was the mayor. Uh, I think everybody can attest to that. The city yeah. was thriving; it was it was doing uh, beautifully at that time. Um, growing up as your father, having your father as the mayor, I mean, how was that? Just the political view, just sitting there watching, you know, lives change and things going on and just moving mountains, honestly. How, how was that? How you know, did that impact you? You know, I think that cuts two different ways. So, like, you get, as a young person, sometimes you don't want a lot of attention. Sometimes you just kind of want to float, Go, float, on, under float, the radar. float on the radar. So I didn't have that experience growing up. Because, I can imagine. You know, there was a lot of, uh, you know... Attention brought on me, a lot of spotlight on me. So, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I remember my parents driving me to St. Matthews, and they had a big billboard on top of the car that said, Voss for mayor. Oh, no. And so, like, you grow up <laughs> with that kind of attention. I mean, like, that's... As a kid, you're like, that's, 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 that steals your innocence a little bit. Like, you can't, you can't be anonymous. There's no anonymity yeah. with that. You know, like, I remember going to my buddy Julian Richardson's uh, high school graduation party. He had it right over here on Rector Street. And it was a big party because, you know, he was a big athlete. And I rolled up, and his dad, he's deceased now, Butch McLean, sees me at the door. I knock at the door. I'm gonna, I know it's going to affect the mic, but I knock, and his, it was, the place was packed. It was a huge house party. There's yeah. no denying it. And he goes, Julian, he can't be here. No, 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 no. I don't want any problems with the mayor. You, He cannot. <laughs> he can come in just for just for 10 minutes, and then he can leave. So, like, things like that, um, yeah. that, you know, change you know, shaped my growing up. But on the flip side, you know, like I said before to you, like I got, to, I had a front row seat to the positive changes. When you're 11 years old, you don't really understand what being the mayor really entails. Oh no. But then you start seeing the positive changes that were going on. Uh, just the physical changes. I mean, they physically changed downtown Perth Amboy yeah. by doing the bricks that are outside. I know they look beat up, but they're also 25 years old yeah. at this point. I remember when it happened. Yeah, it was, the lighting, it was the benches, yeah. the, the waterfront wasn't what it was today. I mean, like, it was totally different. Yeah. They, they refurbished the beaches. They uh, they took back a lot of property. They put, you know, Best Buy was over there. Yeah. Um, U.S. Foods, that was all under my dad. They built a brand-new municipal complex. They built four new schools. They redid, uh, they redid 19 out of 21 parks. They refurbished every street in this town, some of them multiple times, yeah. recurbed the town so you could physically see the, the improvements. And there was, uh, you know, it went, crime went down. The 80s was a tough down, t- yeah. tough time. I know you're big into the into to rap and yeah. hip hop culture, but you, you remember what it was like, and that was real. And yeah. Perth Amboy didn't avoid that either. I mean, Stockton building, Hunterton. I remember a time in the 90s and, and, and early 2000s where people, you know, out-of-towners would be like, you know, I'm not driving down Smith Street because it was, right. it was uh, you know, it, yeah. the, the cops were there. You were going to you were gonna get pulled over if, right. if you didn't do anything, you didn't have your seatbelt on. or it was, it was a safer place at that time, which, you know. Yeah, but it was also a little bit more, I think it was probably a little bit more intimidating at that time. There was less lighting. Uh, there was probably more people, like, congregating yeah. at that time, especially when there, I think there was... Stockton Street at that time, but it really cleaned it up. Oh, right? absolutely. I mean, we had 14 years of lower crime in Perth Amboy. Yeah. And we saw all these improvements. We had stable taxes for a long period of time. So that's that's my perspective of growing up the mayor's son. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I was, I think I was probably a little bit happy to get out of town at a certain point when I went to college. Because you start fresh. Because you know, right? I got to build my own identity. Persona. Yeah. And so that was a good thing for me. Okay, so so let's get into uh, after high school. You, I mean, you played ball in high school and stuff like that. Um, Two years. I didn't, I didn't make it all the way into my senior year. Okay. I was uh, I focused on my other things that I probably shouldn't have been, mostly girls. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, we're men, right? Yeah. So, but um, college, where did you, where did you go? Where I, went, you? I went to the College of New Jersey, Trenton State. Okay. And initially I was a, uh, a bachelor's of science major in with a focus in management. And at some point, I found myself doing really well in finance classes. Okay. So I said, hey, I'm doing well at this, this, this area. Let me take it on. So I did finance, and I did a background in accounting. Okay. So I graduated in 2001, got a job working in Jersey City. Okay. Doing what? Um, um, I, was, I was a financial analyst with a firm that did a lot of municipal bond work. Okay. So when, when towns or counties or public entities – want to raise money they sell bonds, they sell bonds yeah. and they take that money to you know build roads build schools and they pay back the- exactly and so this particular company would advise municipalities and other uh 
uh, organizations that would issue bond issuers as to the best way to structure bonds uh, in an effective way also to refinance bonds. So in the same way that you can refinance your mortgage, you can refinance your bonds. Yeah. So we did some of that. There was a couple interesting cases and I'd like to touch on just a little bit just to give you an idea of yeah. just not bonds. There was a couple towns, I think it was Orange, New Jersey, as well as Hoboken, New Jersey, who wanted to privatize their parking decks, Hoboken, yeah. and Orange wanted to privatize their water system. So they were going to figure out a way to put out a request for proposals to see if, you know, the things that municipal government were doing could be done better, more efficiently by a private organization. So I, we as the advisor provided all the requests for proposals in a way that a municipality can make a decision. Yeah. And I think actually Hoboken ultimately did privatize their parking system. What's your stance on privatization and stuff like that? I think that? it's I think it's a good thing. I think it's something that you can't take off the table. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think um, sometimes uh, government tries to do all things and they can't do all things efficiently. Yeah. It's no different than us humans. Like yeah. you know, like a jack of all trades is a master of none. none. And so I, I think, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, where do you want government resources being utilized and i think the, the number one role of government is to protect the health and safety of the community and if you spread yourself too thin and you can't do it they're yeah, taking away from one place to you know to yeah i got gotcha. you and like you know i'm not i'm not a reagan supporter but reagan did say you know the 10 worst words in the english uh, uh dictionary dictionary are i'm from the government and i'm here to help <laughs> and so like you know like i i don't take that verbatim I do think that government can do a lot of good things, yeah. but you have to recognize, you know, what resources you do have. Okay. So, um, you know, you went to school for accounting and, and uh, finance, business. finance with, a, with, with some back, background in accounting. So I'm working for, I work in Jersey city for a period of time, do that for about two years. And then I got an opportunity to work for the state of New Jersey, working for the department of treasury office of public finance. So instead of advising the municipalities as to how to restructure or refinance their debt, I worked as now the issuer of debt. And so when I worked with um, Treasury, I did that for almost five years. I was issuing bonds as general obligation bonds and uh, on the part of the other state organizations such as the Educational Facilities Authority, uh, EDA, Economic Development Authority, uh, Transportation Trust Fund, the uh, New Jersey Turnpike Authority at that time, the uh, Garden State Parkway, we did the merger of those two roads because they were being operated uh, separately, and they found that if they worked together, they could actually have more efficiencies because there were overlaps. In, that's a huge... Yeah, it was a huge... A huge it, it, it was a, a huge deal. It was a $1.6 billion deal because uh, wow. what they had to do, they had to take out... It was, it was called the New Jersey Highway Authority when it was the parkway. Yeah. And the parkway owned the parkway as well as the Atlantic City Expressway. So... They had to take out all the bonds that had been utilized to maintain the roads for the Parkway and the Atlantic City Expressway, buy them out, and then you could bring it under all one umbrella, which was the New Jersey Turnpike Authority. Gotcha. So we did that deal. We did the NJEDA. So there was a requirement, um, the Abbott decision that decided that determined that kids in urban districts were not getting an equal education. Yeah. Um, and some of that could have been alleviated had... Uh, these urban districts been funded in the same fashion as some of the suburban districts, or well, let's put it this way in a, in a nicer way. They needed more money in order to provide an equal, equal edu yeah. education. That, well, just that's probably the best way to describe it. Not to it. interrupt you, but yeah. people that follow the podcast, uh, that's another subject that we touched on on a previous podcast episode with Victor Coronado was the yeah. Abbott decision and yeah. how, you know, it was um, affecting the education system in, in urban cities. And right, stuff so like they that. determined that the state, ha by mandate, was having a disparate impact on basically people of color. Yeah. Because most of the people that were living in urban districts were people of color. So they, they found that because of the discriminatory impact that it was having on people of color, that the state had a, a mandate to actually fund schools. Yeah. So they, they required that, that they issue $8.6 billion of wow. uh, of bonds in order to fund that gap. Yeah. So I, I issued a lot of those bonds. We did a lot of refinancing debt. I think in total, I issued, whether new and refinanced debt, about $30 billion worth of debt while I was with the state of New Jersey. 
So you have the state of New Jersey on your resume. You have uh, the, the private company you were working for. It was NW Financial. NW Finan- Financial. Your, your experience in finance is... Uh, good. I think it's pretty good. I mean, I've been away from it for a while. Yeah, but that's stuff you don't forget. This is yeah. mathematics. But new, new things come up. So yeah, like, no, absolutely. I'm sure I, you got to stay with the trends and stuff and like I, that. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that. It's just like you, you have to stay up with it. I mean, like, I have a certain fundamental knowledge of how it works. Okay. And I think that... I could very much get up to speed very quickly. So my question is, in a, in a field like that, you know, finances and stuff like that, it's a very lucrative profession. Um, what 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 led you to to the politics? What led you to this this side of the? Oh, uh, that's you know, like I I, didn't, I I don't think I ever saw myself being a politician, and even today I don't view myself as a politician. Gotcha. I view myself as somebody that wants to give back to a community that's given me a whole lot. Yeah. I, I mean that. I mean, it might sound a little bit hokey, but I don't think that. I would have the success that I have today, but for growing up in Perth Amboy. Because yeah. there was a lot of people that would say, and maybe you, this resonates with you a little bit, but like people that like counted us out because they said, oh, you're from Amboy. You're, you're not, you're not going to get to where you're going to yeah. go. And I said, I, I always grew up with that in my head. That and, you know, like my parents were really good parents. And yeah. I wouldn't say they threatened me, but, you know, there was an expectation that we had to meet. And so... You know, I worked hard, and I know that, like, the diversity and the kind of people I grew up around, making Perth Amboy proud was something that was key to me. Yeah. So I ended up going back to law school after working for the state of New Jersey. For what me. drove that decision? I actually wanted to go back and work on Wall Street, if I'm being honest with you. So how's law school and Wall Street so tied to of, each other? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <laughs> so a lot of the people that pitch these $300 million, $500 million bond deals— they're negotiated debt. They're yeah. not. They're not just randomly brought to the market. They're negotiated bond deals that an underwriter takes to the market, places the bonds before you open it up to the market. Yeah. So, like those guys who do those kind of kind of deals, they typically have a law background because not only do they have to understand how deals are structured, they have to know how they're memorialized in documents. So, I had been exposed to a lot of those documents. I had been exposed to a lot of the negotiations of those deals, because like I said, it was about $30 billion worth of debt. So I said, you know, these guys are pretty smart, but like, I can do this. Yeah. And they're getting paid like $14 a bond, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're doing a $300 million bond deal, right, and the $14. denominations are $5,000 a bond, yeah. and you're getting paid $14, you do the math. Yeah, I think Some that. of these guys are walking away with 6 to $10 million on a on a bond deal. Yeah. That's, that's what they're that's, replacing. That's, and I thought I could do it. Yeah. And I said, well, let me go to law school. So I went to law school. I got admitted to Rutgers Camden. Okay. I keep it real. And, uh, <laughs> and my parent, my mother was like, oh, my God, Joe, you got to talk to your son because, you know, I don't know. He wants to go to law school. I don't know if he can do it because, you know, I was walking the earth for a while. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. When walking. did you, what, what, what year, uh, what age did you get to law school? I got to law school, I, I went there in 05. So I was going to be 26, I think. Okay, so you've experienced a little bit at that point. Yeah, and I had settled down a little bit because, yeah. like, I was treating I, – I knew I was going to go to law school and treat it like a job. Yeah. And that's not how I treat undergraduate, if I'm being honest yeah. with you. I was – like I said, I was walking the earth. You understood the investment. Yeah, exactly, and I knew it was on me. Yeah. It was 100% on me at that point. Like, I, I took out my debt for my, my law degree and also my MBA. Yeah. So I, I get into law school. I go to Rutgers Camden. I do well my first year. I, t- I call my parents. I say, listen, I think I'm also going to do the MBA because I have to really set myself apart. You know, I'm not uh, Ivy League pedigree. I'm yeah. not, yeah, I don't come from, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Greenwich, C- Connecticut. Yeah. So, like, the, you the know, lineage I, I, isn't exactly. There. So, yeah. I do anything I can to set myself apart. So, I said, I'm going to go get my MBA as well. So, I did the jo- joint program. Um, the joint program typically takes about four years. I did it in three and a half. I oh, took, so you were focused. Yeah, I was fo- I was I was zoned in, man. I yeah. I, 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 Jen, I Jen was was zoned in. I took summer courses and I got to travel a little bit. I went to uh I went to South Africa. Oh, you went abroad and stuff. I went that. abroad a couple times to take extra classes and I went to Holland for a summer, which was fun. My I had to convince yeah. my parents that I was actually going to study when I went to Holland. Uh, and I, I, I did for the most part. Okay. Uh, so, so then I, that's I, Dutch, right? Like Holland. That's right. Correct. Yep. So I went to, to travel to the International Criminal Tribunal, which is held in Holland. Okay. It's in Den Haag. Okay. So crimes against humanity are, are usually held there. Gotcha. So that's like a, a that was a big part of it. Got it. So I, I took some classes like that while, while I was there. Also, oh, the experience is crazy. Oh, it was awesome. I mean, I had a great experience. When did you finish law school? I finished law school in 2008, but I graduated in December of 08 because I graduated in three and a half years. Okay. So um, then I studied for the bar. Um, I graduated in two really bad markets. 
I graduated in 2001, which was right after 9-11, mm. uh, which was a terrible mark, so I was fortunate to land on my feet. And then I graduated in 08, which after was the, the housing. Correct. Ugh. So I was fortunate Devastating enough, times. Right. So I could not go to Wall Street at that time because Lehman Brothers was gone. They got shot. Bear yeah. Stearns was gone. Merrill Lynch had closed their bond department. So, like, there were a lot of, like, really qualified people that were on the street, yeah. and there just wasn't the work. I was fortunate enough to do well in law school, and I got offered a, a job with a big firm. Usually you get that job offer, like, your, your sophomore year, yeah. your, your 2L year of law school. So it was with uh, Wolf Block, Brock, Brock Eichler. And so I, I got a job up there in Roseland, New Jersey. Okay. So at that time, when I they didn't, with, they didn't withdraw my offer. Which was a good thing. So yeah. I, I got I paid pretty well, and I worked as a health doing health law transactions. So I was representing doctors, uh, ambulatory surgical centers, and hospitals in a variety of business and regulatory transactions. Okay, that's, no, that's, nothing that's, with like uh, malpractice or anything. Like no, that. no, 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 no. Putting together like uh, contracts, like uh, employment contracts, independent contract agreements. Um, you know, deals amongst doctors. Gotcha. And like the biggest thing I did while I was with that firm is they, uh, there was a hospital owned up in North Jersey. I don't know if you know it, the Meadowlands Hospital. I've never heard it was, of it. Yeah. It was publicly owned and it was purchased by a group of doctors. Okay. So that was probably the biggest deal I did. I was up there for about two years and then I spun out and took private practice, mainly because the market never got better. Gotcha. So, you know. So what, what field of law are you in now? I'm in general practice. I own my own, my own firm. Okay. Uh, here in Perth Amboy, I'm on the corner of Smith and High Street. Yeah. Uh, I tend to do a lot of landlord-tenant work, municipal traffic, some small criminal. Uh, I do wills and estates for people that are not, like, worth over 12 million bucks yeah. <laughs> uh, in town. And I do some family cases, not a lot, not a ton of them. I pick and choose what kind of family cases I want to do. Uh, bankruptcy okay. is my background, MBA, law degree. I really enjoy kind of doing that, helping people get back, get, getting a fresh start. I like doing that kind of work. Um, and then I filled out my personal injury and workers' compensation cases. I work with another firm that is a good friend of mine, and they do a good job, and I know that we, we work well together. Okay. So you emphasize that you uh, you got into the political side of things because uh, what you want to give back to the community that gave yeah. so much to you. Um, obviously, your father was mayor for a very long time. How long was that? Uh, he had Eight, 18 years. 18 years. That's quite a run. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the way it ended was, wasn't, you know, the way anybody pictured it to be or wanted it to be. Um, but you learned a lot in that time. And what, what is, uh, how is your vision dif different from your father's? And what do you plan on doing a little bit differently if you were to be given that, that uh, opportunity to run the city? I, I mean, I think uh, if I were to compare myself to my dad, um, I think we, we, sh we share the end goal of like uh, putting a positive spin on Perth Amboy, like really um, maximizing the potential of the waterfront space uh, balancing out, you know, housing with the infrastructure of our community, um, things like that, attracting the right businesses to our community, taking care of downtown Perth Amboy, especially right now with the, you know, with the retail market being hit as hard as it's been hit after the pandemic. You're seeing like Warburg Center Mall just got sold for like yeah, $70 million. It was worth $200 million, I guess, four years ago. Now it got sold to a group of, you know, the, the writing on the wall is that a lot of these retail spaces are, going to meet their demise yeah so we have a unique opportunity to really get the most out of perth amboy if we can attract the best kind of people and we can make perth amboy welcoming safe for people to come into town we definitely have the highways and the infrastructure to get people in and out so i, I share his vision in, in maximizing the potential of downtown perth amboy i think perth amboy might need to build up a little bit more than when, when he was there uh, I think the waterfront has all but halted. Uh, I know you, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically from Smith Street all the way up to Buckingham, that was all slated for redevelopment. Um, Kushner, Westminster Properties, they built two properties over there at the landings and they've all but stopped. Yeah. We have an idle piece of property on the corner of High Street and Fayette Street, which is the old Perth Amboy uh, police station. Yeah. And then you have the... Uh, the um, emergency services and the fire department that's really sat there since my dad left and nobody's really forced the redevelopment of those properties. So they, they sit idly there. They're not paying their fair share of taxes. They're not, uh, they're, they're attractive nuisances for children and for, you know, varmint and yeah. anything like that. So we got to get back to redevelopment. 
I think we have to revisit the mass. I mean, it's a very limited space as far as the city goes and how much space we have and just right, utilizing exactly. what we have and taking yeah. advantage of that stuff. So that's kind of where your vision is. with Yeah, with, and bringing, uh, bringing jobs to this community and yeah. making, you know, getting back to quality of life. Yeah. And we got to improve the quality of life in our community. What do you think about the, um, you know, the, the traffic and congestion and stuff like that in, in town? I'm, and like, listen, if we didn't have the high street extension, which yeah. was done when my dad was there, we would have gridlock. Yeah. In this community. Now, I recognize that most households, uh, most households have more cars today than they did in 1970. Yeah. But that is not the entire issue in Perth Amber. Yeah. Um, and so we got to, you know, recognize that uh, that some of these rental properties have to be registered. We need to know the number of vehicles and we got to do a better job of creating parking if, if we're going to if we have the number of cars that we have. Yeah. Because it's definitely been, you know, something that's, you know, cause, been a cause for concern for a lot of the people of oh, Perth yeah. Amboy and stuff like that. And we're lucky because we have a great grid in Perth Amboy. Yeah. When you think about it, like, think about the way the town is structured. We have, like, High Street that goes north to south. We have State Street that goes north to south. We have three arteries that will take you off of the peninsula because Perth Amboy is a peninsula. Yeah. You know, like, you have you have Market, you have you have Smith, you have Fayette, yeah. and you got New Brunswick that will take you on a slant. All the way out to to Woodbridge, so we, we and Amway Avenue as well that will take yeah. you all the way out to Woodbridge. So we have Amway Avenue is more north to south, but like you know we have the infrastructure. We're very fortunate. Yeah, we are very fortunate because if you ever drive through I don't know, Sarahville, I don't know if you know the lay of the land. They only yeah. have two roads. Yeah, it's like Kernstein and they, 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 they got Washington, they got Maine, and they got Borden Borden Town, and that's all yeah. they have. And so like we are. We are very And we're right lucky. by all the major highways. So exactly. it's like uh, we, we can get in, get out, do what we got to do. Sometimes driving through Carterets, like, you know, you're on one, way, one way, one you know, in one way, out one way. I so. think we got to do make some demands. I think whoever's the next mayor of Perth Amboy needs to start talking with the Port Authority about doing something about the Outer Bridge Crossing. Yeah. Because on, you know, Saturday and Sunday nights. It oh, died. it's brutal. And then you got people cutting through Perth Amboy. You know, thinking they're going to get a shortcut. Mostly, mostly New Yorkers, <laughs> and, and like, but like, somebody. You, have you ever driven to? You've driven to like the Holland Tunnel, oh yeah, yeah Lincoln yeah. Tunnel in the morning, yeah. And they have the they they cut off certain roads. They don't allow you to cut through the local towns, yeah, because people would otherwise try to cut off the traffic to the Holland Tunnel yeah. to the Lincoln Tunnel. For example, has got to consider doing something like that. And we absolutely should because it is an issue. It, 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 it is. It is an issue. And those are residential neighborhoods. Yeah, and you got people flying through there. And they really don't understand they're not doing much by, by going through there. So and, and, and listen, I, we should be welcoming New Yorkers who want to shop here in, in yeah. New Jersey, but it shouldn't be an impediment to residential neighborhoods. Yeah, I hear you. And locals. So um, how do you plan, if you know, given the role, how do you plan to uh, you know, keep in touch with different community groups and, and you know, stay as diverse as possible? I, I believe in the old school way. Well, you know, I, I like town meetings. They have town meetings now, I guess, on the Facebook, right? The Facebook, they have the... Yeah. Sort of, I would do those because I, I think it makes it convenient for people. Yeah. I think we live in a, in a time where you have, you have... One, you have a lot of single-family households here in Perth Amboy, uh, moms who are trying to raise kids by themselves, um, and they don't have the time to, to leave the house to participate. They want to participate because they care about their kids, they care about their community, but you got to make it more convenient for them, whether it be Zoom, whether it be um, uh, these community meetings that they do on Facebook or Instagram, yeah. live meetings like that. But definitely getting back out there to local communities and asking them what their concerns are. The job of being an elected official is really listening. Yeah. Listening, getting a pulse of the community, figuring out what it is that the community thinks is necessary, and then implementing a plan to get there. So the only way you get to know what the concerns are is by getting out there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the criticisms of this current administration that they're not out there enough. Um, to checking the pulse. Checking the pulse of the community. And if they did that and they did a better job of that, they would understand the, the true concerns of the community. Understandable. Yeah. Um, so earlier in the podcast, we were, we were discussing the county line stuff. And I wanted you to just touch on it a little bit more, the importance of, you know, uh, a transparent uh, electoral process and, you know, just how important that is to the to the local elections and just local government in general. So, yeah. number one, during the pandemic, they they implemented Zoom here in Perth Amboy for all city council meetings and for some of the, like the planning board meetings, zoning board meetings, and for whatever reason, Perth Amboy City Council and this administration has done away with Zoom. 
and I just don't understand. They still use Zoom. Now, when you say Zoom, you're talking about the video chats, like the video yes. okay, so conferences. So basically, okay. instead of going to the city council meeting at 260 High Street, you can actually sit at home you on your computer. You just log in and yeah. you get an opportunity to, be, to speak, to watch. And now, you know, most people don't have cable TV. Yeah. Not like when we were growing it's up. It's all we had, streaming platforms. We had Channel now. 34. You yeah, remember? public Channel, access. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Most people don't get that. Do we still have Channel 34? I think if you have like I think if you have Comcast, you have Channel Thirty Four, but it's not really Channel Thirty Four. You know, it's yeah. whatever they call the, the yeah. station. I think Verizon has something that's a little different. Was it still like a, a low? Anyways, yeah. But know. here's the thing. Like, yeah, so yeah. so the, the, the reality is this: a, so now we have a caucus and a city council meeting the same night. Yeah, it doesn't have any tragic cost to the city to have a Zoom, and if you want public participation. Then have it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, it's really not a hardship on the city, so they should continue to do that if they really want to be transparent. These meetings, when they do record them, they post them two weeks later, like after the decisions were made. Yeah, so, like, so it's not really doing anything. That's it's, not transparent. It's not. That's iron fist. Let's jam it down the throats of of the residents. Yeah, it's you know it's a fake complete. That's yeah, what it really is. So I don't agree with that. I think we should get back to posting those videos asap. I think we should go back to a caucus meeting on Monday, give an opportunity for the public to digest it, come back on Wednesday at the city council meeting, and, you know, argue whether or not the decisions that the, the council and the city are making are what they believe are right for the residents. Um, that's number one. Get back to Zoom. Uh, transparency with respect to voting. That's really, I think, kind of what you want to talk about. Yeah. You know, vote by mail, in theory, is a good thing. Yeah. Because it encourages participation in government. In our, and in our democracy. The shortcoming is that there are people out there that are trying to manipulate that process. And they're trying to get those ballots however they can. Yeah. I cherish my, my, my right to vote very much so. Yeah. Because I know uh, where my grandparents came from. I know how hard they had to work and how they came here for an opportunity and more than anything to have a voice. Um, and I want people to recognize that their ballot is their voice. And whether they're being offered a short-term thing like a shop rate card or a box of food, that's not, that should not be the reason. That doesn't equate to the value of your vote. Yeah, and so they're trying to diminish what the value of their vote is by some type of short-term gain. And we got to look at it like this is our community. Don't let them steal your voice. And so I'm trying my best to educate this community about what vote by mail means and what your vote means. And I want to encourage vote by mail because it does make it easier. My wife votes by mail. I don't yeah. have any problem with her doing that. Yeah, everybody loves convenience. Yeah, so. and that's what people want today. I, you know, like that's what we're talking about, these virtual meetings on Facebook. Yeah. So we do have to make it easier, but we can't make it so easy that it manipulates our democracy. Gotcha. That's how I feel. Now, was that ever an issue in the past? In the city? So um, I know that there were some issues in past campaigns. I think uh, probably going back as far as 2014, actually, and it involved Helman Kaba, no less. <laughs> it did. So Helman Kaba at that time ran with Anna Masenik, Fernando Gonzalez for city council. Helman Kaba lost that year, as did Anna Masenik, and then Fernando Gonzalez slipped in and at that time there was a lawsuit because there was some manipulation with the vote by mail i think i remember and it something involves about. the same people same cast of characters okay whether it so, be fernando gonzalez or jose espayat who's really at the at the uh so to bring awareness to the issue is is very important and letting people know what's going on and how we can avoid any type of manipulation right. or or fill out your ballot do not sign it before filling it out because the, they will say to you just sign here we'll fill out the rest that's not the way you vote. You vote your vote by mail. Okay. Well, is there anything you want to you want to say to the people or, or highlight anything yourself? No, I've enjoyed this conversation. I, I listen. How I, do you feel I, about your first podcast? I, I feel I feel good. I mean, I think I feel like I zoned out a little bit. Like, oh, you I'm, definitely were in a zone. I, I was just sitting here watching. It, like, yeah, it, he's good. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I believe in the potential of Perth Amboy. Yeah, genuinely, and I I don't think it's living up to its potential. I do think, and I say this in the most humble way, I think I have. The qualifications to do the job. I also think that I have the gumption and the courage to make the difficult decisions to make Perth Amway the best that it can be. And if I'm given an opportunity to be the mayor, 
I, I plan on doing that, and I would be honored. I would not give up my time with my children or my business to spend myself in a cause that I don't think is worthy. And I think Perth Amboy is worthy, and I really would be so humbled. It would be the honor of my life to be the mayor of the city of Perth Amboy. So. Well, my honest opinion, I think you're very qualified. Um, just talking to you and hearing uh, some of your history and some of the stories you have, just all the families that you, all the families that you mentioned in, in town already. It's like I know all of them. They're all big family. It, it, it's just so much history there, and I think you you're definitely qualified for the position. Um, I wish you nothing but luck. Thank you. Um, is there any any um, any places there where people can find you? Social media, anything like no, that? So uh, PerthAmboy.info. That's our webpage, and if you Google us on Facebook. You just Google JB Voss 2024. You'll find a lot about us as well as on Instagram. I okay. think that's our handle. Yeah, I think I think that's what it is. I think it's I just like, follow it. a handle now, right? Yeah, it's a hand, Instagram Some, handle. Something that Jermaine Clark maybe had? Or, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd love to see the matchup, Urena versus Jermaine Clark. You think they... Uh, well, I, mean, was the thing I was, think Clark still got it. I don't know all the other guys too much. He hurt his, he hurt his ankle, but he, he he played at a D2 school. He was going to my... St. J- Rose, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, he's a, he's a good ball player. I, I know the family very well. I know Phil... I know, like I said, I played baseball with Damien. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think it was a different era, you know? Like, this is what they always do when they yeah. have the conversations about the GOATs. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah Whether it be yeah. LeBron or... Or, uh, or Jordan. Or Jordan. Yeah. They always say, you know, it was a com- more competitive league, <laughs> more of a, 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 a aggressive league, you know. It was different. Yeah. You know, like, they didn't have zone when Jordan was playing. Yeah, it was straight man. And it was a lot more physical. Yeah. So things like that it was a smaller league, so like the talent wasn't as diluted. Yeah. And so like you know, I think it was a little different for Jermaine. Yeah. I think you know, like I think he he was probably the best guy on that team for sure. Yeah. Probably shot the ball a whole lot more because he of that. Definitely put up right? shots. Yeah. Whereas like on that team that we were talking about before, I think that was I want to say that was the '93 Perth Amboy basketball team. Yeah. There were a lot of people that could shoot the ball. Yeah. Adam Rivera. That was the last Yeah, guy. you know what? Shout Adam out to Rivera. Adam. It was Rashid Ra- Adam Rivera, Ernie Gonzalez, uh, Snipes, Snipes, and Greco. Well, shout out to Adam. Adam shows me love all the time. Shout out to Snipes. Snipes is a, a big, good friend of mine. He's doing the comedian thing. He's oh, doing, he's, he's, he's doing always, well at it. He's always, he's consistent, very consistent, and he's been holding down the city for so long. I got to get him on here, actually. Yeah. Um, you know he's got a twin brother? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, see, I didn't know that till yeah. years later. You didn't know that? I didn't, ah, I, yeah. I didn't know that till and I didn't know he was a twin. Yeah. So I didn't find that till years later. So So that's uh, yeah. Shout out, shout out to Sean too. So Yeah, that's crazy, man. So yeah, with that said, I just want to thank you for being on the podcast. Thank Appreciate you, your time. Thank you. You know, Appreciate and um it. good luck to you in the upcoming campaign and then and, and elections and stuff like that. And let's do it again. Yeah, for sure. No let's, matter what. Let's update. I'm with it. We'll I'm, just we'll, we'll just talk old damn boy if you want. I'm with it. I'm down with that. No politics. Let's do it. All right, I'm down. <laughs> All, right, All right, cool. As you guys know, Heart of the City Podcast, your boy Bobby Krills. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell on your YouTube. It helps with the algorithm. And I will see you guys the next time. Thank you.